Okay, everybody. We'll go ahead and uh, resume our presentation, and I'm going to pass the baton back to Dr. Mason. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't thank all of you um, for sharing and making yourselves vulnerable and disclosing. And one of the things I hope we, we, we kind of experience is the importance of creating a safe environment to have these discussions. And as Nora talked about living in crazy times, um, that's even more important in an era that is more polarized than I've ever experienced before. We played around with bias. Um, we're probably offering another bias workshop at CARE Oregon in 2022. We'll be, we'll be doing some of the same thing around identifying bias. One of the hits on bias training is that identifying bias, if that's all it is, it's not enough. So our bias training at, for next year, 2022 at CARE Oregon, is gonna be threefold. It's gonna be, how do you identify bias, including strengths? How do you interrupt bias talk? And then how do you overcome bias, which um, is kind of the full meal deal. The other thing I would urge you to think about around creating a value base is don't minimize that. And as Lupe talked about, um, and, and, I, and I'm stealing from Lupe, um, and teaching is the best way to learn, quite frankly, if you didn't know, is because your students are brilliant, but trying to find equitable, equitable ways of talking why EDI uh, uh, workforce, why class service delivery. And as, and as we mentioned, it will vary by audience. The other thing I would have to suggest is, while I appreciate all of you being here today, I would probably suggest that I have the choir. The people that need to hear this the most tend not to come to my activities. So while I appreciate you here, I'm giving you a special responsibility. Um, internalize the message as best you can and try to be an ambassador. Um, we're all behind the eight ball on the diversification of Oregon, the US, the world. Let's be allies for diversity. Where I want to go now is talking a little bit about, uh, uh, I call the dimensions of diversity and the context of uh, social determinants of health, or what I simply call health determinants because not all of them are social, but that's just nomenclature and semantics. So with that as a backdrop, let's jump into the first slide, Paul. National trends, uh, just saying that we're becoming more diverse. Um, we've even seen it in Oregon. Uh, and as we heard from our guests from Sweden, Sweden is probably experiencing uh, more diversity as a result of in migration because of uh, uh, global events. Um, and this will continue. Uh, as I said earlier, as transportation, communication, information technology increases, the world becomes smaller. So wherever we are, we're going to be encountering diversity. Next slide. Um, again, demographic trends. Uh, we see that uh, how our cities are changing. And, and that this data was from a few years ago. Our cities are becoming more diverse and less diverse. As was mentioned earlier, um, it looks like apparently around 10,000 African Americans left the state of Oregon. So that reduces our number by one sixth or one seventh, depending on how you look at that. But one of the recommendations I give to a lot of us and even to organizations, an organization might look at its footprint in terms of its catchment area um, and look at the demographics of that catchment area. Then they might do a delta between the demographics of their catchment area and their service population. Just to wonder, are they leaving any prospective workers on the table, any prospective clients on the table? That's a simple way of looking at it. Another way that we might look at census data is look at it uh, longitudinally. For example, who the service area was 1990 census, 2000 census, to 10, 2020 and what's projected for 2030, which might suggest what types of languages we might look, be looking for 
It might suggest a quality of life based on owner occupancy, educational attainment, life expectancy, infant mortality, and some markers like that that are, uh, suggest where we are in terms of the health of that community. But just asking you to pay attention to some of the demographic trends that might be surrounding you and kind of go deep with it. There's a book by William Fry, which I believe was a 2018 publication, and it, um, he's a demographer. And, uh, and I'll try to make sure that I get that on the resource list to Paul. A great book. Don't buy it new. It's a million dollars. Uh, try to buy it used. Um, but it's, it's just a real exploration of demographic trends in the U.S. or how to look at demographic trends wherever you are in the world. Next slide. Now we get to what I call the food groups. Um, uh, the, the term ethnocultural cultural is an academic term, term coming from a Ponterado and Cas Casas, two uh, counseling psychologists um, that influenced my work uh, in, in the early days. And they use the term ethnocultural to include everyone. If we just do uh, uh, cultural groups, um, uh, racial groups, we leave out ethnicity. If we just do ethnicity, we might leave out cultural groups. Um, so to begin with understanding the dimension of diversity, these are the groups of color. These are how we define race uh, largely in the US. This, uh, these categories come from the Office of Ma Management and Budget OMB. So we have Black or African American, also uh, you might see African descent. Um, we have Hispanic, Latino Americans more recently, um, uh, Latinx, and if you look at the asterisk um, by that, it was prior to 2000, um, Hispanicity or Latinoness was looked at racially, but then discovering how broad that was, and then Hispanicity or Spanish descent, there's European descent, it just, uh, and so now, um, Hispanicity or Latinoness has become an ethnicity. Now, that's not to say that a lot of Latinos don't identify as people of color. It's just how we categorize them based on the A and B. We see Asian American and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. The asterisk by that is because Asian Americans was combined with Native Hawaiians in previous census. And um, and the thing there is that so broad, just the Asian category alone, but then when you factor in the uh, Islanders, it makes it even broad and very unwieldy and not predictive at all. Native American, American Native, uh, Alaska Native, uh, another category, by or multiracial uh, Americans, and asterisk by that because before the 2000 census, you couldn't, well, you could be biracial or multiracial, but you could only check one box. So that meant you had to choose your paternal or your maternal side or um, uh, in terms of uh, identifying uh, racially. And then I have European ethnicity, uh, European uh, ethnics, um, uh, uh, white people. And interestingly enough, uh, I remember in my teaching days, um, I might refer to a student as white and they would, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, remind me that they were Caucasian, um, kind of in a gotcha moment. And then I would say, where well, your uh, ancestors hail from the Caucasus Mountains in, right? And they would say, where? And, but it's all good. Or, and then I would use the term Caucasian and people would say that they were Anglican or Anglo. I say, descended from the British Empire, right? And they say, what? Um, uh, and so understanding all these categories, or when I worked with uh, in Latino communities, one individual in a family might consider themselves Hispanic, another individual Latino, and um, typically and theoretically his, Hispanic identifies with our European roots, Latino identifies with our American or Western Hemisphere roots, but typically those terms are handed down intergenerationally and you are what your parents told you you were. So we often put a scientific spin on this in ways that other people may not. So for example, you're trying to be PC and you're to call my grandmother African-American, it would be on, and I would bet on grandma, um, quite frankly. My grandmother had trouble with Africa. She hadn't been there. She hadn't taught there. She hadn't researched there. She didn't have uh, African students. Um, I take a great sense of pride 
um, and understanding that I descend from Africa. And so I've studied it. So I don't have trouble being African-American, but not all blacks are where I am. So we want to be sensitive to that. The other thing that's problematic with that category is that includes not only uh, African-Americans who are indigenous to the U.S., but it includes people of, uh, from the African diaspora who are from uh, the continent, but also uh, uh, Afro-Latino, uh, Euro, uh, Afro-European, uh, uh, Asian, Afro, uh, uh, Asian, Afro, uh, centric, uh, a bunch of different groups, and something might be lost in just collapsing that category. So as we disaggregate data, just recognize there might be noise in those data. Um, Hispanic, uh, uh, Latin, La Latino, and I mentioned Latinx, the more contemporary term. What I found is a lot of my Hispanic or Latino friends, for whatever reason, aren't endeared with the Latinx term. So don't necessarily impose it, just like some of my other friends of color don't like BIPOC for whatever reason. Um, understand that this nomenclature is contextual and so forth. Um, but we want to understand that this is how we define race in the in the U.S. Uh, uh, Census Bureau uh, Census uh, uh, data, and there are problems with understanding this or, 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 uh, or using it. Uh, next category. The next slide, I'm sorry. Um, not ethnic cultural groups, uh, which would include women, LGBTQ, people with disabilities, people who are homeless or houseless, people in poverty, um, uh, veterans, uh, religious minorities, uh, etc. Um, and understand that you might be a twofer or a threefer or more. Um, for example, you might find a female who's Asian, who's LGBTQ and a disability. Um, and as we heard in the previous uh, experience uh, uh, session, some of those identities have precedence and some of them are wane in, in a given context. We also want to be sensitive to refugee and immigrants. Uh, the simple way of distinguishing refugees come for survival, immigrants for opportunity. An interesting era to consider, however, would be the early 1900s in the U.S. From about 18 80 to about 1910 was when the U.S. shifted from being an Anglican or primarily British descended country to a much more cosmopolitan country as we got Europeans from Northern and Western Europe. And when they got here, they got trashed by the Anglicans in a big way. Um, and what you saw were the beginning of European enclaves. The next major wave came between about 1910 in around 1925, I'm just maybe 27. And this was largely Southern and Eastern Europeans who got trashed by the uh, immigrants that preceded them. And again, you would see uh, enclaves from Southern and Eastern Europe, uh, uh, which would include uh, Italy, uh, which would include Greeks, Turks, Slavs, so forth. And if you look at the 1900 census data, there were over 20 groups from Europe who were identified as non-white. Um, so you begin to understand that race is really a social and political construct more than a biological construct, um, but it is what it is. Um, and so it's just interesting. A real graphic movie, I think it's called The Gangs of New York, I believe, uh, rather graphic, rather violent, so don't lean into it if, uh, if that's not your want. Um, but it shows how back in the day, um, in various parts of the U.S., um, ethnicity and was recognized on site. So if you were Irish in the wrong part of town, you could have a bad day. Italian in the wrong part of town, you can have a bad day. Jewish in the wrong part of town, you can have a bad day. And if you spend time in parts of the Midwest and parts of the Eastern Seaboard, you can still find these enclaves. So if you're in Chicago, you might find a Polish enclave, Milwaukee, a Polish enclave. If you're in New York or Boston, you might find an Irish enclave. Um, just interesting kind of artifacts of American uh, history. So uh, when we think about the food groups and, and the interesting thing, uh, really cool about racial categories, as I said earlier, the state of Oregon requires us to collect those data now. And previously we would look at people and guess what they were. And this was problematic because we live in the Great Northwest and other reasons. In the Great Northwest, we lose our son, S-U-N, from about September 
to about what September, and so people that would have a melanin charge are um, are kind of um, so. For example, growing up in LA, I used to be the color of a Michelin tire. Um, being in Oregon for 30 years, I've lost a little bit of that. So when I go home now, I got to show ID because they don't really believe it's me. Um, but looking at people and guessing is hard, and that's what we did back in the day. Um, I give you an example when my poor son James, my oldest, was born. Uh, I would love to say it was because I was a young dad, but I was a dumb dad. Took the classes, thought I had it, and then uh, water broke and it was on and whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, it was tough, but I made it through labor. I, I remember that, um, uh, men. Uh, I remember making it through labor. And uh, it was born. They asked me if I wanted to hold him, even though I had on scrubbed. He was a little gooier than I thought he should have been, but I held him because they were expecting me to. Ew, and I gave him back. And they asked me if I wanted to cut the umbilical, and I kind of thought that that's what, I pay them for and I said, no, I did anyway. And it was, yeah. And, uh, but then I went home uh, cause labor almost killed me. Um, I'm kidding. Um, and then I came back and I looked in the baby window and I just saw a sea of white babies. And I said something you should never say, my baby's missing. Bells went off, lights flashed, security came. Someone ran up in there, grabbed a little baby, brought him to me, a little white baby, I thought. I said, this one's yours. Um, James's mom is my color, maybe a little darker. I'm my color, maybe a little darker. I kind of expected a baby, a, a black baby. Um, but they gave me the baby anyway, said the name tag was, 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 was real. And I immediately went to the mom and she was sleeping and in my grossness, I woke her and said, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Um, it's all good. We kept him. He darkened up. But my point is that you can't look at people and, and, and guess what they are. So we've had to learn to ask people to identify. Where we're still at, at a one down position is it still may not be safe to reveal SOGI data, sexual orientation, gender identity. In some cases, it may not be safe to uh, disclose uh, disability data uh, because of the possible consequences. But just want to make us sensitive to the fact that uh, we're just starting to collect these data and just starting to learn to mine these data uh, to discern how we might improve. Uh, next slide. These are some of the uh, uh, factors, uh, the health determinants. These are some of the internal factors that are predictive variables on how people access uh, uh, health systems, how they might comply with uh, 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 treatment, things of that nature. One of the areas I want you to be sensitive in understanding people is cultural and versus racial identity. Racially, I'm black. I'm of African descent. Culturally, you have no idea by looking at me, typically. And what isn't a smooth thing to do is say, yo, James, how black are you? That probably wouldn't go over well. Um, and if we think about our history and our uh, our practice in healthcare, when I first meet you, what I'm probably going to ask you is your health history, mental health history, sexual history, drug and alcohol history. And it probably won't give you a warning that I'm going to be real gross and real uh, uh, intrusive. And for a lot of cultures, that's way too intrusive. Um, something I want you to think about is next time you're at a mall or at a party, walk up to a stranger and start that healthcare line of questioning. Uh, health history, sexual history, alcohol and drug history, mental health history. Here's the thing. If they start to answer you, get away. That's a weirdo, right? Um, but we need to, we need this information. Now, something we can begin to ask as a fence mending question is you can't say, yo, James, well, I don't say yo, James. You can't say, uh, Mr. Mason, uh, uh, what kind of food do you like? Um, as a way of getting some insight into who I am culturally. What kind of music do you like? Uh, what holidays do you celebrate? Those are questions you can't ask on a first encounter. So if you were to ask about my music, I might tell you, ooh, wow, ooh, wow, I really love Tom Jones. And I'm glad I still have my Engelbert Humperdinck collection. And I'm so sad that Lawrence Welk isn't on TV anymore. And then you might roll your eyes and say, oh my God, we got one. Um, but it's just a way of kind of, uh, now my approach is because I'm a foodie, is I typically ask people to share recipes and wonder about what kind of food they like. Gives me some kind of idea 
about their uh, food security. It gives me some kind of idea around their food access. It gives me some kind of idea around the health, uh, healthiness of their diet. Um, but it's important for us to kind of distinguish between cultural and racial identity and also understand that some groups come to the U.S. to assimilate, some come to the U.S. and retain their identity, Come, some come and become bicultural. There's no pejorative uh, uh, purpose in that at all, but just understanding that that's the case. Socioeconomic status is the intersection of education, occupation, and income. And that becomes an important way of understanding who you're serving. Um, I'm not first generation college. I'm not first generation urban. I'm my mom was first generation homeowner. My dad was no generation homeowner. Um, my dad was an SC graduate. My mom was a UCLA graduate. Um, all I knew I was going to school or they were going to bury me in the backyard somewhere. And interestingly enough, coming to Oregon, I, it was I thought everyone aspired to college, uh, uh, but I found out that Southern Californians were very different than Oregonians in terms of their their outlook. In Oregon, we had a history of timber, history of fishing, mining, steel, shipyards, uh, 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 truck making, and a strong back and a work ethic. You could make a very decent living. Those days are leaving us a little bit, so we're kind of worried that way. Uh, in Southern California, that wasn't the way that you made it. Uh, higher education was the, the path to uh, economic self-sufficiency. Uh, but just understanding who we're working with and their vulnerability by verse, of, by verse of their education, income, and occupation is important. Nationality. We call people Asian. They might consider themselves Cambodian. That might be more important to them. We call people Black. They might consider themselves Nigerian. That might be a greater sense of identity. We call them Latino. That might consider themselves a Puerto Rican or a Guatemalan. Um, that's important to know. Um, in many cases, uh, we aren't able to catch, capture, or we don't capture that information, which might have some uh, clues in on how they might be eating and how they might be able to find uh, food uh, consistent with their culture. Uh, language is also an important variable. Um, a language and communication style. And with the communication style, I'm talking about who speaks for the family, for example. And in some cases, it might be an elder who speaks for a child. In some cases, it might be a mom or a dad who speaks for the other for the other spouse. Um, and from our lens, that may feel somewhat oppressive. It may not be for them, but we want to be sensitive to how language is used. Um, family history. Um, how they got to the U.S., how they got to the city, um, um, help seeking behavior, how they found you. Were they brokered by an ad, by a church, by an elder, by a previous customer? Generational status, generations American, generations English speaking, generations urban, generations college, generations uh, uh, homeowner. All those things are predictive variable. Um, understand your uh, uh, customers in terms of age and life cycle. For example, the biases that I had around a 16 year old who's a parent of a two year old and feeling real rest assured, uh, a 32 year old parent of a two year old um, and learning um, the nuances of that and where I was way off. Uh, spatial and regional patterns, urban, uh, urban rural divide and what that implies. Uh, gender and sexuality, how important those are, particularly the intersection of gender, sexuality and race age, disability, we want to make it really nuanced. Um, religion and spiritual views are also critical. Um, and in many cases, we don't capture faith, which might be a great source of strength for uh, some of our patients and some of the commun communities we serve. In fact, it's one of the ways that in many communities, the way that you begin developing trust is entering through the faith based community and political orientation. I'm not talking about blue or red. I'm talking about the extent to which someone is willing to self advocate. So if you're from a war torn background and complaining about government or complaining about services or complaining period meant that you might disappear, people like that might not say a whole lot. Or if you're someone who struggles with English, you might do a lot of affirming nods, even though inside you're doing this. Um, uh, understand that we might have to find other people to speak or create critical mass of safety for people to speak on what's really going on. Otherwise, you might just keep affirming nods 
when you know they don't get it. Uh, very similar when you are working with a patient and you ask them, do you know what I mean? And you get this. And then as soon as they walk out of the examining room, they turn to their partner and say, oh, do you know what he said? Do you know what she said? Um, that kind of nuance. So I want us to understand that when we think of health determinants, there are some internal factors that impact how people seek help, uh, what they look for in uh, uh, services, um, uh, how they define illness and health, how they define a viable treatment. An interesting way of doing this is uh, showing this really quickly is, um, and we can do it in the chat. I'm just gonna wake you guys up for a minute. I want you to think back to when you had a cold as a child. Um, can you put in the chat what your family did to treat a cold, common cold? Or put it out either way, unmute yourself and just shout it out. What do we do for a cold? Anybody have a uh, something they grew up with that was practiced when they were a child? Seven, Seven up. up. You got it. You got it. Um, I've also heard ginger ale. Um, uh, Tylenol, um, if you're old enough, you got aspirin, but we don't do aspirin anymore. Um, eat soup, um, orange juice and rest soup, uh, ginger ale and Vicks. I came from the Vicks family, uh, Vicks on the chest. My dad put Vicks on our chest, Vicks on our back, Vicks on our nose, Vicks on our mouth. Uh, me and my three, uh, two sisters looked like brand new shiny pennies. We were so Vicks up. Um, uh, what else? I've heard, uh, uh, Asafetida, a southern herb um, that's worn around the neck, smells very interesting, uh, for want of a better word. I heard of onions around the neck, garlic around the neck, um, kerosene and sugar. Don't know what, how that was used, but I've heard that. I've heard nothing, uh, TLC, uh, cough drops, uh, and particularly the, the sweet, good, tasty cough drops. Um, many, 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 many more. Um, what's the right way to treat a cold? I'll give you the answer there too. All of these, all of the above, including nothing. A week to 10 days, a week to 10 days. Now, even though I know VIX has very little therapeutic value, and not to knock VIX or anything like that, when my kids got cold, guess what I did? VIX on the back, VIX on the chest, a VIX up the nose, uh, VIX in the mouth, and my kids look like brand new shiny pennies. And what I got to do with like my dad did was throw him in the bed and watch him slip right on, on the other side. So I know VIX has no therapeutic value typically, but it's comfort food. So if you were to say, oh, that VIX is a dumb idea, what I probably think is you're talking about my mama. You're talking about my dad. And I probably wouldn't say anything to you, but I probably wouldn't come back to stuff that's hurting. So if I were to push this group really hard, I think we have over 50 people we would absolutely get 30 different remedies for a common cold. And like I said, um, all of them are about equally effective. We're all here. We all outlived it, right? Um, including the cod liver oils and the castor oils and the ooh, gross, gross, gross stuff. The most interesting one I think I got was, I'm not so much smudging or some of the indigenous approaches, um, but some young lady in Arizona, her mom sliced tomatoes and put them in her shoes and sent her to school anyway. Uh, the imagery I got of being in Arizona with tomatoes in your shoes uh, would just make my head blow up. But just want to give us an idea that there's some internal determinants around people seek health, how people seek health care, and we want to be sensitive to the nuances there. And we also want to understand that there's great diversity within group. So saying black with some of some of these qualifiers, saying white without some of these qualifiers, Latino, Asian, Native without some of these qualifiers, might have us misdirect how we help. So just want us to be sensitive to that when I ask you who are you serving. Next slide, please. These are some of the external factors, some of the more uh, celebrated and acknowledged uh, health determinants. For example, some of the institutional biases, um, racism, sexism, homophobia, ageism, ableism, classism, they all exist. And what's interesting is it doesn't need someone from a dominant culture to impact those biases or execute or exact those biases. One of the first studies that I did was in a large behavioral health uh, hospital in um, 
uh, an Eastern District. And there are about 3,000 residents in the facility, 80% African American, around 3,000 workers in the facility, 80% African American. So you had what was called racial consonants. The providers looked like the patients. When we began to evaluate outcome data, the outcome data displayed disparities as if the staff were not representative of the patients. I'm saying that to say that as an African American, I can impose uh, uh, racism on another African American almost willingly. As a hetero uh, um, or, or as, a, as a woman, I can impose sexism, or as a poor person, I can impose classism. We just want to understand that um, just because one is doesn't mean one is. There's certain African Americans that I wouldn't want to work with African Americans, certain women I wouldn't want, want to work with women. We don't want to be that simplistic. Now, that's not to say I don't believe in workforce diversity. I do believe in the rainbow look. But I also believe in the rainbow effect, right? So we want to understand that a lot of, and uh, thinking about this in the context of trauma, as came out in the, in the last session, last section, segment of this, a lot of us have uh, trauma around race, around uh, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, veteran status, age, uh, poverty, things of that nature. So we just want to be sensitive to the biases and how they creep in. Too many economics is another factor. Um, I got in trouble saying this, uh, so I'll get in trouble again, maybe. Um, someone told me that they served white people, only white people, so they had no diversity. I'm like, really? And my question to them is in Oregon. Um, we have a coastal town that has fallen on hard times, um, very, very prideful, historically blue collar, uh, healthy town, Coos Bay. Working class now, having a little trouble with opiates, a little trouble with unemployment, a little trouble with other um, negative factors, versus one of Oregon's most wealthy communities, um, uh, Lake Oswego, or more, more specifically, Dunthorpe. So when you're talking white, are you talking Coos Bay white or Dunthorpe white, right? Uh, Dunthorpe, Dunthorpe is a, a predominantly white community, great, great cars, great, great houses. It might have some racial diversity. There might be a blazer there or two. Um, but my point is, is that we want to see diversity when we see people, not when we just see people who look different. We want to recognize that diversity exists within any category and without uh, understanding some of the biases. Um, anyone can be hit with an institutional bias based on um, their identity. Um, and similarly, community economics, if the community wants to stay in life, if there aren't the jobs that people want, if there isn't the uh, food security that people need, you might see pathological behavior that isn't tied to their culture, but more tied to the biases and economic structure of a community. So going back to the European ethnic, ethnic days of the early 1900s, <clears throat> when you saw the emergence of Greek mafias, Irish mafias, Italian mafias, Jewish mafias. It wasn't because they were predisposed to uh, illicit behavior. It was because they were kept out of other business enterprises. And another, uh, there were signs that predominated no Irish or Italians need apply. No Irish, no uh, Italians, no dogs need apply. Um, that was rampant during the uh, early days of European ethnicity. Another thing that we want to be sensitive to, in addition to community economics, which often results in illicit behavior such as drug trafficking and, and drug use, is understanding the public safety infrastructure and infrastructure therein. Is it safe if we're trying to tell a customer or a patient to walk to relieve stress, to walk to offset weight gain, things of that nature, but they feel uncomfortable uh, walking because it might not be safe? or uh, why we might keep kids inside if the parks aren't safe, if the parks aren't supervised, and if the kids go to the park and all they find is drug, sex, and rock and roll, you might be more likely to keep your kid uh, sedentary on a couch getting unhealthy as a result. Also understand the behavioral health of a community. Is a community mentally or behavioral health, uh, from a behavioral health perspective, is it healthy or do we even do an assessment there? Uh, um, we want to be sensitive to who we're wor are working with in terms of their context that way as well. Um, thinking, for example, of living in a community that's rife with opiate addiction or a community that's rife with um, oh, crack or cocaine addiction, things of that nature and what might happen. 
uh, the cultural maladaptive behavior that might occur as a result. Geographic or cultural isolation. What does it mean to be the only uh, trans person on a staff? Are the only trans patient? Are the only trans person in the community? Are the only Jewish person in the community? Are the only um, a Hindu in a community? Things of that nature. Um, and, and just some of the tension that might come with that and some of the reluctance to engage that might come with that. Intergroup relations. Uh, inside and outside our institutions. One of the things that we're trying to promote uh, in most organizations is multicultural team building so that we begin to expand the idea of what fit means in an organization um, or to discern if there are any tensions in our workforce or in the communities we serve and how we might be able to bring those together. Something else you want to be sensitive to is natural networks of support that might be ex uh, existent in a community. I remember in my days as a therapist, um, client would come in and I was taught to ask how they how are they doing? And they would say, I'm good, just cold and hungry. And I learned to do this pensive nod thing. I don't know if I was taught that or if it's just uh, in a and I would say, how does that make you feel? And they would say cold and hungry. And I'd say, go with that a bit. And they would go cold and hungry. Um, what I learned was, even though I was doing mental health, behavioral health, if I didn't play that cold and hunger game, they weren't going to play my behavioral health game. If we're not going to play their cold and hunger game, they're not going to play our stop smoking game. If we don't play their cold and hunger game, they're not going to play our, our safe sex game. So even though I was in mental health, it was important for me to have information around a winter coat around energy assistance, around a food basket, food security um, at the front desk to uh, make sure that I lock people into treatment. So part of what I'm asking you to think about as another determinant is the extent to which natural networks of support exist in a community, including faith-based institutions, um, and the extent that we can incorporate those into our treatment plans, or the extent that we can partner with them or collaborate with them to sh uh, uh, shore them up to be more impactful in the communities they serve. The community history is also important. Um, an example might be Oregon's black community. I mean, Oregon is an interesting state in that it didn't allow blacks in the state until uh, the, oh, 1900s. I think it was 1904, if I remember correctly. Um, before that, um, if you were black, in the state too long, I think it was two weeks, um, you might have to do a, a, a jail term. Um, and that was because Oregon didn't want to deal with the slavery issue and the way they decided to deal with it was not allow blacks in the state. Um, Oregon was populated largely by Okies and Arkies during the Dust Bowl and Southern uh, residents who were largely unskilled labor that came to work in Oregon's unskilled uh, uh, industries. Our African Americans came primarily during World War One, World War Two, to also work in those same industries. Um, you had a Vanport flood, flood in the 19 late 1940s that wiped out half of, displaced half of a uh, Portland's black community, uh, was almost cut in half overnight. We also saw residential segregation that uh, moved Portland's black community. Um, beginning down in the uh, west side, I think by the uh, downtown bus station to the area around the Coliseum, a little bit north to the area around Legacy, uh, then a little bit east and now way east with gentrification. And now the black community is spread to hell and gone, as I like to say. So the idea of serving them um, in a concentrated area it may not be any longer possible. Um, just understanding community history, certainly understanding the Asian experience or the uh, uh, native experience or the Hispanic experience, um, or the immigrant experience, and things of that nature are important. And it might suggest the extent to which um, it's easier or hard to engage folks. The political climate, um, are we turning a little bit more intolerant? And we see some of this happening in Western Europe as they are feeling the pinch of immigration and refugees um, have become just a little bit resistant. Um, we saw the U.S. Uh, go up and down on how we feel about immigrants and refugees. Um, and right now, as, as I said earlier, we are really kind of bipolar in our red and blueness in ways that are probably detrimental to the benefit of the country. 
Uh, something else we want to be sensitive to is um, the diversity of our workforce. Um, huh. I was talking last night to a bunch of dentists about um, my experience coming to Oregon. I grew up with a black dentist who happened to be a friend of my dad's. They were World War II buddies, both Marines, both black. Dr. Johnson was the first black dentist to graduate from USC. And uh, he's always our dentist. Our orthodontist was a lady named Dr. Carter, uh, Ruth Carter, um, who was the first black orthodontist, I think, to graduate from USC. So those, and our family practitioner was Dr. Coleman, also a black guy. And then when I moved to Oregon, I had to find a dentist. And I got a white dentist through Kaiser. And uh, I remember when he was working on me, I started laughing. I thought of a silly joke. And he said, why are you laughing? I said, um, I, I just had a thought. And he said, what? I said, you're the first white man to have his fingers in my mouth. And I have an urge to really bite down now. And I was kidding. I was seriously kidding. But he pulled his hands back and was kind of hesitant. I had to get a new dentist. It's, it's all good. Um, and I don't use that joke anymore. But, but my point was, um, uh, it was difficult for me to find a dentist I was comfortable with because my, and a doctor that I was comfortable with, because historically all the doctors I'd ever, and dentists I'd ever had were black or of color. And um, interestingly enough, if you look at the health data by race, pre-integration, post-integration, you see kind of an interesting dynamic that might be kind of worrisome. And then we want to understand community demographics. Do people feel safe in, a, in, in an instance that there are in enough number that they can come out and move freely in a given community or do they feel somewhat stigmatized? For example, um, if I'm in parts of the state and I'm LGBTQ, and particularly the T or the I or the two S's, do I feel comfortable expressing myself or do I feel less comfortable? Do I feel comfortable coming to a health institute? One of the things that a quick and easy intervention that we used to broker to uh, health programs and health organizations is making sure that there was signage, making sure there was imagery that might show two moms, two dads, that might show people of color, that might show people with disabilities, just so that you knew that you belong, that you might in the waiting room put literature that was relevant to everyone and not just uh, you seen the usual stuff, uh, Red Book, Selling Circle, Reader's Digest, uh, Field and Stream, and the diversity comes from Sports Illustrated. And uh, and so we say, oh, well, we can't we can't afford all those subscriptions. Well, libraries throw away magazines on the daily, so you might be able to go and find magazines that you can uh, uh, introduce to the waiting room, and 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 they don't have to be current because Reader's Digest was from 1993 anyway. So what's the deal? That National Geographic was 2003 anyway, so no problem. And but just putting imagery that make people who would otherwise feel estranged feel like they belong. So again, when we begin to think of health determinants, understand that there are internal factors and external factors that have implication. So for example, language might be a health determinant with Latinos. It makes sense. Not so much with uh, third generation Latinos. Um, I took a job in Salem years ago and it was uh, my first chief diversity officer position. And it was a uh, uh, printed in um, the uh, Hispanic press. And I have some fake or play tia, some play aunties who were nurses with my mom down in LA, uh, uh, Mexican American descent. And I was so proud and I sent them the the, the, the Spanish newspaper. And, and, my, and my aunties, my play aunties still spoke Spanish as did their kids and what have you, and, and still ate the food and uh, did the, the, the cultural things. And she wrote back and said, mijo, uh, really proud of you. Uh, we don't read and write Spanish anymore, but I was really glad to receive the newspaper. And the fact that you weren't being perped walked out of a building, I figured was a good thing. So I figured this was a good story. Um, what I'm suggesting is that understand that language is nuanced and it makes sense for certain segments of a uh, of a group and maybe less relevance for another segment of a group. Now that has nothing to do with health literacy, which I think is universally important. Next slide.
Here's a, some of the natural networks of support that we might begin to work with merchants and business people. And what I'm really talking about there are the mom and pop stores that exist in various communities, which have their fingers on the pulse of a community and know who's uh, what's going on. And one of the ways you can detect a mom and pop store is uh, the title on there is from 2015. Um, and I'm being silly, but not too silly. Uh, other uh, resources that exist in these communities are unheralded leaders or elders. Um, when I used to live in inner northeast when it was black back in the day, I lived across the street from an elder, Miss Shirley, my mom's best friend when my mom moved up here. Miss Shirley was my kid's play grandmother for years. And I remember one day Miss Shirley asked me to take her to Safeway on my way to work. And she called up and said, James, can you drive me to Safeway? I'll run in, I'll run out, then you can drive me back home, and then you can run to work. And I said, no, Miss Shirley, I'll be late for work. She said, that'd be okay. I'll be waiting on the porch. I had two doors to my house. So I went out the front door instead of the house, the door that faced Miss Shirley's house. And I drove to work. And I got to work and my phone was flashing. And first call was from Miss Shirley saying, I'm on the porch. And the second call was from my mom saying, why didn't you drive Miss Shirley to the store? And I called my mom and I told her I would be late for work. And she says, no, you wouldn't. Miss Shirley would run across the street. You would drive her to the store. Uh, she would run in the store. She would run out. You would take her back home and then you would go to work. And, and I said, no, mom, I'd be, be late. She said, that's okay. So interestingly enough, Miss Shirley's an elder and I come from a community where people matter. I work in a culture where time matters. And so that was an issue uh, for me. Um, and besides, uh, with all due respect, Miss Shirley is five feet tall, 350 pounds, and she doesn't run very often. Um, so the running to and from, and, and, no, it wasn't going to happen. Um, love Miss Shirley to death, um, but I had to move. Uh, that was the, the only salvation. But just suggesting that you might want to put on your network, on your Rolodex, if you were to still maintain a Rolodex, are just some of the elders that might exist in a community that you might meet at the Cinco de Mayo, that you might meet at the powwow, that you might meet at the TED event, that you might meet at the Pride event, that you might meet at a veterans event. Um, when you go to these uh, events, make sure that you find people that you can network with faith-based institutions, and that's faith writ, writ large. That's the, the temple, the synagogue, the church, uh, the sweat lodge, uh, uh, so forth. Try to get them on your network. Ethnic media and and, and uh, personalities. We are, well, we, Care Oregon is currently doing a project with Univision. Um, I've worked with them for years, and they are often more credible with a population with whom I may not be. Advocacy organizations, make sure we're connecting with the ERCOs, the Latino networks, uh, the Slavic community in Eastern uh, uh, Portland. Um, they exist all around and wherever you are in the or Oregon, uh, uh, the state of Oregon or the US or outside the US, try to find the advocacy organizations that might be just a little bit skeptical when you first approach them, but stay in the saddle long enough and they'll begin to appreciate you. Um, others are collateral agencies. So for example, our agency also works with other providers. We want to make sure that we're uh, brokering them when we're thinking comprehensive, uh, our wraparound, our systems of care, our, our flexible service delivery. Uh, social networks. I'm talking about the uh, the Elks, the Moose, the Rotarians, um, the fraternities, the sororities, the other social service organizations that might be brought to bear to help a family, including the Salvation Army, including Goodwill, things of that nature. And then lastly, Consumer and family member organizations, NAMI, for example, the Mental Health Association, these are US based organizations, but others that might represent consumers and can speak on behalf of consumers better than sometimes they can speak for themselves. Next slide. Okay. Um, so in this breakout, uh, breakout two, and I don't think I'm going to be joining a group unless I'm beamed into a group, but uh, describe the diverse groups you currently serve. For example, uh, demographic trends, health beliefs, health determinants, etiquette. Um, also wonder about their cultural strengths and community-based assets to the best uh, of you know. And the second question that I really want us to kind of weigh into, so facilitators make sure we devote some time for this, is talk about any cross-cultural success stories or key informants 
um, or other resources that help you work more effectively across cultural differences. Now, some of these re resources might be bibliographic. If you have a book that was really powerful for you, um, if you have a, a website or a podcast that was really powerful, or if there's someone in the community that you align with, a rabbi, uh, 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 an imam, uh, uh, a medicine person, a shaman, uh, 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 a, a priest, uh, things of that nature. Where do you go when you need to know? Here's something else that you might find impactful. Have you ever made a mistake working cross-culturally that you learned from? Don't be afraid to share that as well. So what I want us to think about in our next breakout session are these two questions. And I would interpret the questions loosely any way that you want and take the conversation anywhere that you want. And um, I will give us around 20 minutes or so so that we have time to debrief and wrap up. Um, so I uh, felt facilitators, you got your work cut out for you. Um, you ready to beam them into their rooms, Paul? Hold on. Transporter is standing by. <laughs> oh, hold on to your seats, folks. Here we go. Yeah, I've got the safety bar down on my lap. I'm excited. <laughs> See you shortly. Hey there, everyone. We are all coming back together here today. And as usual, when you have a lively group of this many people who are engaged around an exciting topic, time starts to become uh, a precious resource. So I'm sorry we didn't have as much time as we had hoped we would for this second breakout group, but we really want to make sure that we don't uh, siphon off too much of Dr. Mason's remaining time for content. So James, we'll leave it up to you in terms of what you think, how many, uh, different groups we have time to get a uh, report out from uh, just to make sure you have enough uh, uh, space left uh, for your remaining content. And I'll pass it to you, my friend. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to think that we all got a pretty good handle on understanding who we're serving and some of the determinants that impact their lives. We will make that the second question. I think what I want us to respond to by group is let's start if we got too many success stories. I want to hear what's good. So typically when I ask these questions, I feel like I'm picking at scabs with the first three. And the fourth question is kind of my healing question after making people um, be vulnerable and self-disclose. So let's start with what's good. Um, any success stories coming out of group number one? We might have to remind who group number one was. Group number one is Sarah, Susan, Deborah, Aaron, Jamie, Tommy, Marilyn, Beverly, and Chrissy. Tommy, any success stories? Hello, guys, everyone. Um, we just had, well, one success story that was mentioned of working on a reservation and just um, not being aware of the full um, Native American heritage in America and just going, being part of the reservation and adapting and becoming part of the um, culture in a way of understanding and mutual respect. I thought that was a positive. Um, I don't think we had any other really stories as far as tools that we're using in the community except for around language that was discussed in my group. Tommy, I think that's a more powerful story and it has can be generalized. I know my experience on reservations, I had some real good experiences and I thought that I was wonderful and then I went to a couple of other reservations and they didn't know me and didn't think I was so wonderful. And so one of the secrets that I learned is the idea of paying dues. They got to see you come back. They got to see you weather the storm. They got to see you take the beat down. And this was with um, an Upper Plains tribe that was really resistant, but they saw me as a descendant of Buffalo soldiers and they had trauma as a result of the U.S. Army, Calvary, Buffalo soldiers, African-American soldiers being 
pitted against it. And so until they knew that I was safe, in particular, the elders were very, very uh, suspicious. I didn't get it until maybe the second or third visit that I had to be humble, sit, sit down quietly. Then finally someone embraced me and said and felt sorry for me and said um, that I wasn't as bad as they originally thought I was. But it, you got to pay dues. You, you got to be willing to stay in the saddle. Um, yeah, it's a tough um, tribe and it's, you have to be tough, tough skin and really open yourself up to your vulnerabilities and that you don't know everything. Yeah. And just like you were mentioning in the previous section, as far as African-American and black, you also have to remember that with the Native American tribes. I lived on the Navajo reservation, but there were three or four different tribes that we worked with. And just like everyone else, you know, there are similarities and their differences. I just think going in with respect and not uh, not judgmental, a non-judgmental attitude goes a long way. Yeah. Thank you, uh, group number one. Group number two. Sister hey, James. Story. Jonathan here, I'll speak to group number two, and then of course others can jump in. Um, you know, a couple successes that we kind of just generally talked about. Uh, one is the, the uptick or the ongoing um, dedication to identifying uh, pronouns when you introduce yourself and just how that seems to be more and more in our experience when we're in, you know, different settings and how amazingly powerful that is for folks, you know, to, to automatically feel like they can present their pronoun and have it respected um, just goes a long ways. And, you know, it just, I think, you know, we've been working towards that for years and just kind of seeing it kind of come uh, to full fruition is pretty amazing. So I think that was a great success. And then- hey, um, Let me, let me yeah. interrupt for one second, because I absolutely agree with you. And, and and I also think that what's also cool is and unfortunate is when people are overlooking pronouns and someone has to introduce that concept. So I appreciate the people that have the courage when we don't display the etiquette and suggest that people are welcome and valued, that anyone can initiate the pronoun sequence, I would argue. Didn't mean to interrupt you, Jonathan, I'm sorry. No, and I think you're totally right, James. And even recently, I had an experience where pronouns were introduced and a, and a member of that meeting were kept using the wrong pronoun for a person. And um, again, to your point earlier, unintentional, not something they were intending to do by any means. And the, the meeting stopped, which I thought was really powerful. And someone said, can we just pause the meeting for a minute, regroup on pronouns, this person's been using the wrong pronoun. Let's regroup on that. And I just thought like even beyond us using pronouns, but also to your point, the courage to stop a meeting and make sure that person uh, is safe because we're using the right pronouns with them. I thought was like, again, such success. I don't know that I see that very often. So how powerful that is. Thank and then the time. second thing, um, Oh, we had some new folks who come have come into our organization at Care Oregon in particular, and just saying like they're seeing such an increase in the diversity pool in terms of hiring and um, how they feel so uh, happy to come into a place where the pool that they can then choose from in terms of hiring is much more diverse than they've had in other places. So I thought that was also a really great success that we don't necessarily hear very often. I thought those were great, Jonathan. Thank you. And thank you for being here today. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah. Good to see you too. Um, group number three. I I actually want to prompt maybe Shane and Sarah from our group if they would tell their stories of success. I thought they were really um, interesting, great examples. And while maybe one of them unmutes and gets ready, um, Kristen also had a good resource she shared in our group was there's a book called The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down. Um, she said it's about a social worker in the Hmong community in California. Um, and several people said, I think that they had read that or that that's a really good. Um, it's Ann, Ann, Ann Fadiman's book and it's um, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. I think it's all. And You Fall Down. Experience. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, Shane, would you be willing to uh, 
talk a little bit about your work with the primary care providers in patients? Yeah, um, so basically I, I, I was, uh, we were talking about how diverse the, the people that, um, that each of us have as individuals um, work with and, um, you know, our, our organization is, is quite large and we break them down into, into bridges and each bridge has a certain like geographic area. And so like the area that I work with is, you know, um, very diverse and um, one of the people um, that well there's a couple of them that I work with um, one of them uh, self identifies as a uh, black female and um, I uh, you know I worked with her for actually quite some time and uh, another is a Hispanic male and um, being able to uh, connect with their primary cares to facilitate just the just the way when we were talking about language primarily and the way that we communicate and um, you know both of these individuals were not being heard um, and being able to you know so support them in being able to like okay how do how do these people come and meet me where I'm at um, is you know and and these people that these people have been discharged off my panel for six months at least now and they still call me and it's very moving that these people could still call me just to check in um that to me is a success so that's what my story was love that thank you um jillian in our group also had shared that she's had really great experiences working with skilled interpreters um or family members who interpret, who not only have the language, but they have the cultural understanding. Um, and that sometimes that's really crucial to help understand the patient's needs in a way that she wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And then Sarah, along that line, can you share your story? Hi, can you hear me? I switched to a different mic. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I just shared uh, a long time ago when I worked in um, a subacute inpatient setting with um, kids and families. Um, I was pretty green and we had an interpreter working with a family. And to me, things looked like they were going smoothly. And then the interpreter and the family left and the child and I had a session. And the uh, child said to me, uh, oh my gosh, my mom thought that interpreter was trash. And um, so while the the child and family and the interpreter spoke the same language, uh, culturally, um, they were very different. And it was just, um, it was a real learning experience for me. Um, and uh, it sort of affected the course of treatment a bit. And I had to work really hard to find a different interpreter. Um, and then to just notice how um, when you're developing relationships with interpreters, um, it's not just necessarily about the language, it's also about kind of the cultural ambassador piece. Um, so I not quite a success story, but a great successful learning story, I would say. No, I, I think it's a phenomenal story. Um, I, I used to train healthcare interpreters on cultural awareness and cultural competence. And quite frankly, I've often seen people connect culturally or socially and not linguistically. So I think that it's possible to speak the language, but not do the culture in a way that keeps a barrier between you and the interpreter. That's a great discovery, I think. Great job. Anything else, Kelly? Um, our final note is that um, one of our folks also said that on their team, she's experienced, sometimes it's important for patients to see that they have a team member who shares their culture, their ethnicity, or maybe their background, and that that has helped the patient to connect or be able to, um, you know, make use of resources or, you know, feel um, trust and connection as well. No, that, that's absolutely true. Um, it lets them let their guard down, as I was saying, and when we can't do that, can we do it with imagery or language or, or, or symbols in, 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 the, in the environment? Um, I'm going to move to group number five success stories really quick. Ooh. <clears throat> okay, group, Kathy here. If I'm misinterpreting, please, please uh, jump in. 
talked about uh, COVID and the use of technology and uh, the challenges of working with folks who don't have access or may have government phones or don't have money, um, learning from each other on care teams and from the diversity of experience, uh, just connecting and learning and then uh, being patient. Uh, Juliet shared a story of working with a member that uh, wouldn't even look at her and then now is looking at her because of her patience and humility and is um, engaging with resources and um, believing that people are resilient more, resilient, more resilient than perhaps we think. So that's kind of the summary of our conversation. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate your brevity. Um, and something that I hope we might be able to take back to where we go is this activity of sharing cross-cultural success stories. I typically say, can we carve out five, 10 minutes at the end of a staff meeting to build on someone else's knowledge, to build on someone else's experience as a way of helping us learn more exponentially or geometrically and not so arithmetically? How about for the sake of time, group number seven? Hey, this is Adam, uh, Care Team Supervisor, St. John's Region at Care Oregon. And what we talked about um, is some of the successes we've had, both us and the pharmacy department at Care Oregon, in getting, getting creative with different populations, uh, particularly around the COVID vaccine um, outreach and how we uh, went ahead and, and, and listened and were creative and were patient with different populations that we really hoped would come in and utilize the vaccine um, efforts that we were making, especially with clinics around town. And I shared a little bit more about how Multnomah County was doing a really good job in having a lot of printed materials in a number of different languages. So when people came in to get their vaccine, they had information handed to them before they even saw a provider that they could read through in their primary language. And if they didn't, if they couldn't read something or they didn't understand what we were talking about, we had a device right there when the person walked in to communicate with a, an interpreter. So there was a lot of openness and, and uh, proactive enthusiasm about making sure people understood what they were there to get and could get their questions answered before they even walked into a room with any needles. So it was uh, a lot of nice success in, in getting people in and trying to invite them to bring their family members and community members since they were there, it's like we would say, yes, bring bring your the rest of your family in to get vaccine or, or bring your community members in. So it was really great. Thank you, Adam. And for sake of time, I'm just going to close with um, I want to thank the presenters. I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank um, the, the, the you're sharing your courage, your vulnerability, your self disclosure that helped me see this as a fairly successful day. Um, this last slide just talks about our journey. It's a developmental process. Wherever you are today, be better tomorrow. Show yourself some grace, show yourself some love, and show yourself the courage to move forward. Paul, any parting words before I let before I, I leave it leave? No, I just want to thank everybody for uh, making time for this wonderful content here today. And special thanks to Dr. Mason who put all this together. It's been a phenomenal experience to get a chance to share working together with you. I hope this is the first of many similar meds eds along this topic. So I think the hunger for it clearly surpassed our ability to uh, accommodate via time today. So we'll be sending you information next week, folks, about how to claim your CEUs and CME credits. And uh, we'll be posting recordings of this session up in the weeks to come. And uh, you'll be seeing lots of similar and new content coming your way in 2022. So thanks for everyone's patience with our technical issues here today. And uh, we're just delighted to be able to participate in this together. We'll uh, pass it back to you, James, to, to wrap things up. Great job, everyone. Really want to thank the production team that made this so enjoyable and so much fun. Uh, Paul, Ian. Uh, Kristen, Allende, um, um, Laurie. Um, I also want to thank those of you who served as um, pre uh, moderators, facilitators, note takers. Um, uh, this wouldn't have been possible without you. And just want to urge us all to continue to move forward, grow each other, and support us during these journeys that are sometimes painful, but critically important for the work that we do. Um, have a great holiday. If I don't see any, some of you who I know before the holidays, uh, 
let's wish for a better 2022. Thank you all. Have a great day.